Well, friends, um, first of all, with, with Don's funeral on Wednesday, um, I've already got words running around in my head for that, but um, there'll be a little bit today that will speak to Don's life as well, so that will be mixed in here as we go along. But there's some really, really incredible things that happen in this text that I want to lift up, not only because of what's happening with John the Baptist, but what these words mean for us and how we live our lives and how we live out our faith. So again, here's, here's John rotting in prison, and he, he's losing patience with God. Um, he's wondering if he was completely wrong about everything. And because of his preconceived notions about what God should be doing, he is blind, actually, to what God is actually doing. So John sends his disciples to go and say, Jesus, are you the guy or not? Because John's expectations had been, um, not only would the Messiah come uh, and, and make the world better, but he expected that when the Messiah came to do this, that the Messiah would clean house. Okay, like you and I, John looked at the world around him and said, there's a lot of stuff wrong here. He looked at the world around him and he said, uh, injustice run amok. Injustice run amok. The folks on the bottom don't have a shot. The folks in power are out of touch and they're ruining everything. And so when the Messiah comes, he's gonna fix it. He expected Jesus to come and clean house Make and make the world right. Sounds like, you know, a good expectation to have of the Messiah. But the fact was, that's not exactly how Jesus was doing it. Jesus was bringing God's kingdom to life, but he was bringing it to life in a different kind of way. That is, a less obvious, <laughs> in-your-face kind of way. Instead, he was challenging the whole system, but he was changing lives one life at a time, and along the way, empowering his followers to then go and continue that mission on. But as John is waiting for the whole thing to change in an instant, he's missing that Jesus is actually on the move making this happen. And so he expresses this frustration, this doubt, and, and, and Jesus says to his disciples, hey, go back and tell John what you see. Go back and tell John what you see. The lame can walk, the deaf can hear, the blind can see, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Go and tell John what you see. In other words, I'm doing exactly what I said I was going to do. Go and tell him. And so as we come into today's reading, Jesus has just got done sending those disciples back to tell him, yes, I'm here and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But Jesus does not turn and chastise John. Instead, he points to all the ways John has been faithfully living out the call that God had put in his life, right? And so John turns to the, to the crowd and he says, he says, what, were you looking for a weak reed? In other words, were you looking for somebody who just will say the, the thing that everybody wants to hear? Were you, were you looking for the guy who would just go with wherever the wind was blowing and say the most convenient thing? No, no, you weren't looking for that, were you? And he says, were you looking for uh, uh, the guy in power with, with riches and luxury who, who uh, uh, you know, had, the, had the access to the political system? And he says, well, of course you weren't looking for that because, you know, what do we know about that? It probably means out of touch. It probably means... Um, being willing to do whatever it takes to stay in power and being willing to do whatever it takes to, um, uh, to, to have access to all the things that you want. In other words, someone like that is probably more likely looking out for themselves than anyone else. Of course, that's not what you were looking for. You weren't looking for either of those things. It says you were looking for a prophet. And that's exactly what John is. He's a prophet. And in fact, he says he's not just a prophet. He's the prophet. He's the prophet who has prophesied to come and prepare the way for the Lord, for the Messiah. That's who John is. And John did that work well. And he says, in fact, I'll tell you, of all who've ever lived, none is greater than John. And then this curious statement, yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Now, when you hear Jesus say something that doesn't quite make sense, 
it means there's something really profound and you better spend some time thinking about it, okay? He says, I tell you, of all who've ever lived, none is greater than John, yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. And so today, I want us to spend our time thinking about a couple things. First of all, so what does he mean when he says kingdom of God? And how... And what does John preparing the way for Jesus have to do with you and I preparing the way for Jesus? How do we do that? What does that look like? And ultimately then, how do we see the kingdom of God coming to life? How do we see that happening? How do we see that happening? Now, as we begin to think about that idea, well, what does he mean by the kingdom of God? Uh, I want to for a moment reflect on uh, some of the specific things that John was teaching. So back in Luke chapter 3, this is four chapters earlier, before he was thrown in prison, we read a few things about what he was doing. And the first thing we read is this, that um, John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. So John was calling out to people. He was saying, get ready for God to come. Uh, Get ready. And the way you get ready is by repenting, and then receiving forgiveness. Okay, in other words, we have a holy God, and in getting ready for a holy God, we ourselves need to be purified and cleansed. And so come to the water, be baptized, and this baptism that he was offering, the baptism itself isn't what cleansed them. The baptism was a physical representation of what God was doing spiritually. So you come to the water saying, I am a sinner, I'm in need of God's forgiveness, and you emerge from that water receiving that good news that you have been forgiven. So he's calling people to look at their lives, recognize that they're not holy like God is holy, to repent of that and to look for forgiveness. And then he goes on to say, prove by the way you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. So not only did he call them to this baptism, this one-time act, but then he said, and then let the way you live show that this is what's happened to you. Live it out. It should be obvious in how you live that you've repented and been forgiven. It should be obvious in the way you live. Okay, and then now, and now here's where we see though, um, John John sort of misunderstands what Jesus is gonna do. So he says, even now the ax of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the tree. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. And then he goes on to say, the Messiah is coming. He's, he's so much greater than I am that I can't even untie his sandals. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then he says, he is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. He will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn and burning the chaff with never-ending fire. And then that passage concludes with this sentence. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. Now, to me, that's sort of a funny statement. He used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people, right? Okay, so, right? so John's mindset, again, as we said earlier, was that when the Messiah comes, he's going to clean house. That's what John was expecting. And so he expected the Messiah to gather the wheat into the barn, but he also expected him to burn the chaff in a never-ending fire. And so he's looking for that to happen, and that doesn't seem to be happening. In fact, what do we see Jesus doing? Jesus does almost the exact opposite. As Jesus is confronted with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and all the folks who in that society were considered the unclean ones, Jesus doesn't burn the chaff. Instead, He throws his arms wide open and he says, welcome home. He says, come on in. He says, let me love you and forgive you. That's what Jesus does. What we see, what John missed is that the Messiah wasn't coming to clean house. The Messiah was coming to welcome home, to welcome home. Now, isn't that interesting? As we consider this idea of the kingdom of God, what I want us to be thinking about is what is God like? And of course, we see mo- we, the best example we have 
of what God is like is how God was revealed in the life of Jesus. We look at how Jesus lived. We look at how Jesus taught people. We, um, we look at, at how he treated them and what he taught, and we get some pretty good insights into what God is like. And so we start at this place that we have a God who is a God of welcome, a God of embrace. But there's another way to say that that uh, I, I thought was pretty profound on Tuesday night when um, Tim Johnson was here. Uh, he said it kind of like, like this. I'm going to paraphrase, but he said, our God, well, one of the adjectives who des- that describes our God better than anything else is that our God is a generous God, a God of generosity. Now think about this for a moment. Who is it that's given you life? God. And who is it that lavishes upon you forgiveness and grace and mercy? Who is it that generously welcomes you home? Who is it that generously offers you everything you need? It's God. That if one incredible word to describe who God is and what God is like is generosity. That in fact, God is more generous than we could ever hope to be. That everything we have comes from God as a gift from God. That that in a really incredible way, defines what our God is like, a God of generosity. And now, what do we see in Jesus? Well, he gave it all away. He gave it all away. Even his very life he gave away. Wow. Wow. Could it be that we are most like God when we're generous? Could it be that we're most like God when we give ourselves away? This idea of the kingdom of God. A phrase that we use in our Lutheran theology is we use this phrase, already but not yet. Already but not yet. In other words, the kingdom of God it already exists. In, in one way, um, it, lives, it exists in its fullness in eternal life, in heaven is the kingdom of God in its fullness. But when we say already not yet, what we mean is, so you and I, we don't live there yet. Our friend Don does. We don't. But already we get to experience the kingdom for moments. We get to experience the kingdom. It comes to life for us at various times. We enact the kingdom. We enflesh the kingdom. We bring the kingdom to life as we live the way God calls us to live, as we prepare the way for God. So when you and I generously love, the kingdom of God comes to life. When you and I generously forgive, when we offer mercy, when we offer grace, the kingdom of God comes to life. When you and I give of our time, when we give of our treasure, when we give of ourselves, the kingdom of God comes to life. I know a lot of people who experienced the kingdom of God when they were with Don Wallace. You want to talk about somebody who is generous, Don Wallace could never help all the people he wanted to help because he had too many other people he was busy helping, right? It was like, oh, yeah, um, let me come over and help you with that. Let's see. Well, uh, you know, and of course, he wouldn't brag about anything, but it was pretty clear. He already had 10 other people he had to help first. When I was with um, Verna and their daughters, Amy and Jill, yesterday, they were kind of um, laughing and joking or telling stories and having, you know, there's lots of wonderful memories. And they said they were kind of joking that half the houses in Mesa were wired by Don. And uh, many of those for little or no cost, right? That Don was just giving of himself, of his time, of his talent, all the time. Preparing the way. Bringing the kingdom of God to life. To life. Now, You know, Don Wallace is just like John the Baptist in that Don Wallace was not a perfect man. 
Folks, John the Baptist did incredible things for God, but he also got it really wrong. And here he sits in prison and he's basically giving up on Jesus. But Jesus did not turn around and say, look at all the ways John missed the mark. Look how John messed up. That's not what Jesus is focusing on. No, instead, Jesus affirms who John is and what John has done. And friends, I think he does the same thing with you and I. God intends for us to be more and more like him every day, to grow in this generosity, to grow in giving ourselves away. But sometimes we really miss it. Sometimes we really miss it. And John the Baptist thought that if we missed it bad enough, that Jesus would come and sweep away the chaff from the threshing floor. And instead, Jesus came and he said, come on home. And that's what he does with us. We miss the mark. We mess it up. We don't get it right. We are not judged by God for that. We are loved and welcomed home. Bringing the kingdom of God to life is not reserved for perfect people because there are none. It's not reserved for those who merely have uh, learned enough about the Bible or gone to church enough times or whatever we think those rules might be. Bringing the kingdom of God to life, preparing the way for Jesus is for all of us. It's for you and I each and every day. But the way the kingdom of God comes to life is not when you and I try to make life for ourselves. It comes to life when we make life for others. When we give ourselves away, then the kingdom of God comes to life. A lot of folks experienced the kingdom of God when they were with Don Wallace. And I'm willing to bet that people would say the same thing about you that there are times where the kingdom of God comes to life when they are with you. We all know we don't do that very well a lot of the time, but there's glimpses of it. And the good news is we're loved and forgiven and welcomed no matter what, and we're not stuck where we're at. We get to keep growing every day. We get to grow in this every day, my friends. It is possible for you and I to look more and more like Jesus with each passing day. It's possible. So today, um, I see this response from Jesus. He says, I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John, yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Can you imagine Jesus thinking that of you? That you're a great person in his kingdom? That sounds like nonsense, doesn't it? But it's not. Because God's given you everything. And God will work through you to bring his kingdom to life if you will allow him to. That is good news for us. And more importantly, it's good news for this world. Now, friends, we're not always going to get it right. But we have a generous God of love and grace and mercy and welcome who's with us every step of the way. Let's pray. Oh, dear Lord, dear Lord, how often we wish that your kingdom was our full experience all the time. We see all that's in this world. We see the injustice. We see the suffering. We see all that is wrong, and it wears us down. And we're tempted. We're tempted so often, Lord, either to give up or to just focus on ourselves, to get what we need, to do what's best for us and forget everyone else. Forgive us, Lord, for our selfishness. Forgive us, Lord, for not trusting you enough. Forgive us, Lord, um, for not believing that you want to work through us right now, this very moment. So, Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come each and every day in us and through us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to prepare the way for you as we become more like you as we, Lord, 
as we become generous people, generous with our love, generous with your grace and your mercy, generous with all that we've been given so that others may know your kingdom, so that others may know who you are. So Lord, empower us each day. Fill us with your spirit. Renew us. Transform us. Thank you. We thank you for Don. We thank you for the ways that he lived out your kingdom. And we ask you to help us to do the same. We pray these things in Jesus' name.